Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm joined here today uh, by the Interim Chief Medical Officer and uh, the Health Secretary is not with us today because she is about to answer a question in the Scottish Parliament later this afternoon. Um, I'll start, as I always do, with an update on some of the key statistics in relation to COVID-19. As at nine o'clock this morning, there have been 15,653 positive cases confirmed uh, through our NHS labs. That is an increase of 14 since yesterday. A total of 1,011 patients are currently in hospital with confirmed or suspected COVID-19. That represents a total decrease of 31 from yesterday, including a decrease of 14 in the number of confirmed cases currently in hospital. A total of 21 people last night were in intensive care with confirmed or suspected COVID-19, and that is a decrease of three since yesterday. I'm also able to confirm today that since the 5th of March, a total of uh, 3,820 patients who had tested positive for the virus and required hospital treatment have now been able to leave hospital, and I'm sure all of us wish all of them well. And in the past 24 hours, seven deaths were registered of patients confirmed through a test as having COVID-19. The total number of deaths in Scotland under that measurement is therefore now 2,422. Of course, tomorrow we will have the weekly report from National Records of Scotland, which includes both confirmed and suspected cases of uh, people dying from this virus. Now, after two uh, consecutive days of reporting zero deaths, today's figure of seven is, of course, not what we would have wanted to hear. But I think it's important to stress that it's not a surprise either. Uh, as we have consistently said, we know there is a weekend lag in registration of deaths. And so the numbers we report on Tuesdays are usually higher than those we report on Sundays and Mondays. Uh, and to give some context, last Tuesday, for example, we reported uh, 12 registered deaths. So today's figure, though an increase in the last two days, is nevertheless, and I, I want to stress this, a further indication of a clear downward trend in the number of people who are losing their lives to this virus. And that, of course, is clearly welcome. We know, however, that this will be no consolation whatsoever to people who are grieving these lost lives. The figures I've just read out are not just statistics. They represent individuals who are being mourned and grieved by many. So once again, I want to convey my deepest condolences to everyone who has lost a loved one to this illness. I also want to express again my thanks to our health and care workers. The whole country is so grateful to you for everything you continue to do during this very difficult time. And during what is Carers Week, I also want to thank our unpaid carers. This pandemic has demonstrated again the importance of what you do, but it has also, I know, created additional stress and anxiety for many of you. That's why the Health Secretary announced some additional help for young carers on Sunday. And of course, it's why we're paying an additional coronavirus carers allowance at the end of this month to those who receive carers allowance. In addition, we've also helped carers centres to work remotely. That means that help, advice and support is still available online or on the phone to all carers across the country. That support is not just available to people who have been carers for several months or years. It also applies to people who've had to take on caring responsibilities as a direct result of this pandemic. So I'd recommend to any carer, including any new carer, that if you need advice or if you need some practical help or maybe if you just need a friendly word, you can search for your local carer centre on the Care Information Scotland website and get in touch with them. Help is available for you if you need it. Uh, but finally, my thanks once again to all of our carers for everything that you do. Your efforts make such an enormous difference, uh, obviously to those that you care for, uh, to all of their loved ones, and of course to the wider community and our whole country. And all of us are very grateful to you for that. Now, I want to highlight uh, briefly two further issues today. Uh, firstly, I can confirm that we will publish initial data in relation to our test and protect system tomorrow. Uh, that information will include how many positive cases have been identified so far through test and protect and how many of those have had their contacts traced. 
At this stage, this will be national data, although we do intend to break it down regionally in the weeks ahead and add more detail to it. It's also data that will, at this stage, of course, reflect the early stage of Test and Protect. But one point that it's important to note at, at this stage is that the figures we publish tomorrow will not completely match our daily testing figures that we publish at uh, this daily update, because they will also include results from the drive-through centres that are situated in various uh, parts of the country. The COVID update I give tomorrow uh, will be, as is now usually the case on a Wednesday, delivered in Parliament just before First Minister's questions. Uh, so that may be too short for me to explain those new figures in detail uh, tomorrow, but I will say more about them later in the week. For now, though, I want to stress that if you have symptoms of the virus, uh, and let me remind you that that's a, a new continuous cough, a fever, uh, or a loss or change in your sense of taste or smell, if you experience any of these symptoms, you should immediately take steps to book a test. Please don't wait to see if you feel better first. Do it straight away. Uh, and you and your household, of course, should isolate immediately. And you can book a test at nhsinform.scot or by phoning NHS24 on 0800 028 2816. And if you don't have symptoms, but you are contacted to say that you've been a contact of someone who has tested positive, then please do follow the advice you are given on self-isolation. I can't stress enough that the willingness of all of us to fully cooperate with Test and Protect in uh, the weeks and months to come will be absolutely vital to our efforts to keep the virus suppressed as we try to restore some normality to our everyday lives. Second issue I want to cover relates to the impact of COVID-19 on people from our minority ethnic communities. Public Health Scotland's preliminary analysis of data from Scotland, uh, which was published uh, towards the end of, of May, doesn't appear to show that people from ethnic minorities are disproportionately affected by COVID in terms of its impact on their health. Uh, but these are preliminary findings and they are findings based on limited data. And we know that studies in other parts of the UK and indeed around the world have uh, provided different results to that. And we also recognise that people from ethnic minorities could also be disproportionately affected by the economic and social impacts of COVID-19 as well as by its health impacts. The Scottish Government has already allocated uh, more than £500,000 to organisations that work directly with ethnic minority groups across Scotland, but we know that we may well need to do more. And for that reason, I am establishing a new expert reference group made up of academics and other advisors. And that group will consider the evidence on, uh, of COVID-19 in Scotland, including the data provided by NHS Scotland, National Records of Scotland and Public Health Scotland, to assess the impact of the virus on minority ethnic communities. In areas where COVID is having a disproportionate effect, they will also make recommendations on uh, policies and approaches to mitigate that. It's always essential at any time to listen to people from our ethnic minority communities, to work with them and to ensure that the policies we adopt and implement don't have disproportionate and adverse consequences. It is, however, especially important at this time, and I hope that this expert reference group will ensure that our response to COVID-19 takes full account of the needs and the experiences of our minor minority ethnic communities. Finally, before I hand over to the Chief Medical Officer, I want to end by emphasising once again our key and very important public health guidance. Right now, you should still be staying at home most of the time and you should still be meeting fewer people than you would normally. If your life feels like it's getting back to normal, ask yourself why that is the case, because it really shouldn't be yet getting back to normal. When you do meet people from another household, uh, you must stay outdoors and must stay two metres at least apart from them. Don't meet up with more than one other household at a time and don't meet more than one a day. And please keep to a maximum of eight people in any group. Wash your hands thoroughly and often. If you're out of your home, take hand sanitizer with you. Please wear a face covering when you are in shops or on public transport or in any enclosed space where physical distancing is more difficult. Avoid touching hard surfaces and any you do touch, make sure you clean them regularly and thoroughly. 
And as I said a few moments ago, if you have symptoms of COVID-19, a new continuous cough, a fever, a loss or a change in your sense of taste or smell, you must get tested and follow the advice on self-isolation. And above all, for all of us, if, if we all remember each and every day that the decisions we are taking as individuals now have a big impact on the health and well-being of all of us, uh, then we will all do the right thing and make it uh, more likely that we get through this crisis more quickly. Uh, so my thanks to all of you for joining us today and for continuing to do uh, the right thing, because as the figures that I've read out again today show, it is making a difference. And for that reason, we must stick with it. I'm going to hand over now to the Chief Medical Officer, who's got some uh, information on the science uh, surrounding COVID-19 uh, before, of course, moving to questions as normal. Greg. Well, thank you, First Minister. Today, I want to update you on some of the work being conducted by scientists in the research community in Scotland. Specifically, I want to speak about the cutting-edge work to understand the genetics of the virus that causes COVID-19 and how this is being used to understand how it has spread in Scotland. By looking at the genome sequences of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, this work is able to identify the very subtle molecular differences between different viral isolates from people who have been infected. This allows scientists to create family trees for the virus so that it can be tracked in time and in place. This allows us not only to visualise how the virus spreads, but how it evolves over extended periods as well. Crucially, it also allows us to check that the PCR testing we use to diagnose the infection remains faithful to identifying this particular virus. The use of this next generation sequencing technology has allowed us to identify at least 112 separate introductions of COVID-19 across Scotland that ultimately led to sustained community transmission. It has identified viral lineage, lineages with no clear link to travel at the very early stages of the outbreak in Scotland, suggesting that there may have been earlier introduction to Scotland and community spread even before the first cases emerged. In this respect, the emergence of continental Europe as the global epicentre of the epidemic appears to have been the main source of the particular lineages that have established in Scotland. This work has also enabled us to understand the pattern of spread that was associated with a sports conference that took place in Edinburgh at the end of February. Beyond the eight cases already known to be associated with this outbreak, there are three other cases with a genotype that may be linked to this lineage. Of those three cases, Two of them are more closely associated with samples that came from other cases identified in other countries and have been discounted as being directly linked to the conference. The third shows similarities to those associated with the conference, but no direct or indirect link to the conference has been established. All show similarities with a viral lineage that is found in continental Europe. However, this particular sub-lineage of the virus has not been detected in Scotland since towards the end of March. This suggests that the actions taken by the IMT to manage this outbreak were successful in curtailing spread and have led to the eradication of this viral, particular viral lineage with, with no evidence of any wider outbreak um, associated with it in Scotland since that time. This new technique helps inform our learning and our future approaches to outbreaks of different types of infectious disease, whether they be at the scale of clusters of cases or part of the management of a pandemic across international borders. It's a source of pride to me that Scottish experts are at the forefront of this work and will continue to work collaboratively with them to further develop our understanding and inform our approaches to the management of COVID-19 in the future. I hope that was of some interest to you. And what that demonstrates, of course, is that our scientific community here in Scotland is very much at the forefront of these global efforts to both understand and combat COVID-19. And as Gregor said, that should be a source of pride, albeit in difficult circumstances, for all of us. Um, I'll move now straight to questions. Uh, the first question today comes from Glenn Campbell from BBC Scotland. Afternoon, First Minister. I wonder if you can explain why more than 200 people with coronavirus uh, have died in Scotland, having picked up the virus in hospital wards that were supposed to be COVID free and how you would explain their deaths to their relatives. Um, I uh, view every death from this virus, uh, wherever they happen and wherever the individual contracted the virus from to be a tragedy and to be a source of real regret and my 
Uh, condolences and sympathies uh, are, are all with the families uh, affected in this way. Um, in terms of your specific question, I know the Health Secretary, I said earlier on, she was uh, not here with us today because she's about to answer a question in the Scottish Parliament. That question is specifically about uh, what's called nosocomial infection, where uh, infections are uh, potentially uh, picked up by people and contracted in hospitals. Now, she'll uh, give in Parliament this afternoon some figures uh, Previously, she's given figures about the number of incidents and the number of patients uh, that that uh, may have affected. I think one point to be uh, very cautious about and just uh, make sure is understood, and it would be a point I would make in, in response to your question, is that it is really important, and actually what Gregor's been talking about here is important in this context, and I'll hand over to him. Uh, because somebody is... Uh, diagnosed with having uh, this virus in a hospital, uh, whether that's a patient or a member of staff, it does not automatically and necessarily mean that they contracted the virus in hospital. They may have uh, picked it up in the community and had it or been incubating it when they came into hospital. And so what we have to, to go through is a process of validation of these figures uh, and you know, additional scientific work so that we understand better the extent to which uh, infections amongst patients or people working in hospitals were actually contracted in hospital uh, or may have been contracted elsewhere. And uh, that is another application of the kind of science Gregor's been talking about today that we will find very useful in the period ahead. So I would just caution about using these numbers uh, that it does not uh, necessarily mean that all of these infections were contracted in a hospital. We have much more work to do before we can understand that and draw more definitive conclusions about it. But I'll hand over to Gregor, who may want to say a word or two more about it. It's, it's really important that we continue to learn how this virus spreads. And we, we know already from the evidence that's accumulating, not just here in the UK, but from around the world, that this is a virus which particularly um, is, is easy to spread within institutions and, and, and indoor environments, particularly where there are vulnerable people, and particularly where um, there, there are a lot of kind of movements um, around about that institution as well. Uh, as the First Minister has already outlined, it's, it's really important that we understand whether these infections that you refer to were infections which were communicated within that institutional environment or whether they were brought in from outside sources, people were in, incubating the infections at the time. One of the ways that we can do that is to look at these family lineages that I spoke about in, uh, 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 through the understanding of the molecular sequencing. That can then help us to understand how these particular virus families spread, not only, as they say, in the communities, but, but actually spread from person to person within hospitals. And this isn't a new technique. One of the things I want to get across here is that this is a technique which we are applying in relation to how we manage infection outbreaks in, in other scenarios, but, but we're using specifically now to understand better SARS-CoV-2 and how that spreads from person to person. I, I just a final point here, and it's, all of this is really important because it is really important that we understand patterns of transmission so that in future we can try to break those chains of transmission. But both in terms of the figure uh, Glenn quoted there and also some of the information that I know the Health Secretary will be discussing in Parliament later, um, it would not be accurate right now to say that we are certain that all of these uh, cases of the virus uh, were cases where the infection was uh, contracted in hospital. We don't know enough yet to, to draw that conclusion definitively. So anybody that, that, that said that that was the case uh, would not be accurate in how that was was being interpreted at this stage, but there is work ongoing uh, for us to further understand that. In fact, there is a lot of work across government right now uh, on th this whole issue of nosocomial infection, uh, infections that are picked up and spread uh, within hospital uh, settings. Ross Govins from STV. Afternoon, First Minister. Are there any particular geographical areas of Scotland that are currently causing you a concern regarding the R rate and how is that shaping your thinking ahead of the possible relaxation of further lockdown measures? Um, th there is no part of the country that I would say right now is causing me um, greater concern than any other part of the country. The overall picture with uh, COVID-19 continues to cause me concern, although as uh, I've talked about in the last few days, we are certainly seeing all, all of the indicators now going in the right direction. We've spoken before, um, I've spoken before, Gregor's spoken before about the uh, the, the difficulties uh, given 
uh, some of the confidence intervals that you then start to deal with in trying to regionalise the R number within Scotland, because the, the smaller the area uh, you're looking at, then the smaller the number of cases, the smaller the number of, of, number of deaths, although every death, of course, is is a tragedy, so therefore your your degree of uh, uncertainty around that gets greater, which is why we are uh, reporting the R number right now on a, a Scotland-wide basis, although we look very carefully at all of the, the different indicators in each health board area across the country. So in, in all of uh, parts of Scotland, all of this is going in the right direction, um, but I would, I suppose, caution on, on two points. Uh, Firstly, and people are, are used to hearing me say this, that progress, while very real and now looking very sustained, is still fragile. Viruses can very quickly flare up again and run out of control, which is why we need to stick with the measures that are helping us uh, to uh, suppress it. Um, and the second point of caution uh, I would inject would simply be that we... Our current understanding of the R number, which was last reported last Thursday, it predates the phase one changes we made. So we haven't yet had long enough to see what the impact of the changes I announced uh, just over a week ago to allow more outdoor activity will be. Now, hopefully there will not be a negative impact of those, but we need to take the time to monitor that. And that's uh, something we do very closely and on an ongoing basis. And we will publish uh, the, the latest uh, estimate of the R number on Thursday. We now publish it every Thursday, which will also have our latest estimate of the, the prevalence of the virus, the, the numbers of infected and infectious people across the country. Do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I think I touched upon this yesterday in the, in the, in the use of um, the, the different indicators that we have at our disposal to try and assess where we are. Um, across the country, we've got those lead indicators, things that give us an advance warning of, of, of um, the, the developing picture, but also those lag indicators, which take that little bit longer and help us to calculate um, um, the, the R number and the, the overall prevalence of, of disease in Scotland. And at the moment, what we have is a picture in Scotland which is generally one um, which is stable and improving, and there's no particular areas that at this moment in time are causing me any concern at all. Okay. I, I don't want to blind people with science, least of all blind myself with science, because Gregor is the expert here, not, not me, but uh, one of the things we are increasingly uh, looking at and try to understand is, is what's called the K number. Uh, we've heard a lot about the R number, but the, the K number now is a measure of the, the number of people that are responsible for uh, the, the amount of transmission. And, and that is uh, very much relevant to other particular settings or events that, that can cause clusters and effectively become super spreading events. So our, our knowledge and our understanding of transmission is developing all the time, uh, which is really important to understanding how we need to use initiatives like Test and Protect to best break those chains of transmission. And that understanding will also be important as we continue to lift the lockdown because it will give us a better idea of the, the, the things that we, we continue to want to limit versus the things that we feel more confident about uh, lifting. So all of this is, is under uh, ongoing and constant review as we try to, to navigate the right path forward here towards uh, something that looks a lot more like normality than the conditions we're living under right now. Uh, Peter McMahon from ITV Border. Uh, thank you, First Minister. Uh, First Minister, ITV Border has been looking at your policy of testing for staff in care homes. Uh, we've obtained a document from NHS Borders, it's the 29th of May, which said that there was neither, neither they nor NHS Lothians have the capacity for that level of testing. Uh, Scottish Borders Council say they've been allocated 480 tests they have 1,200 staff and they'll need to rely on the new portal, uh, which isn't, uh, as far as I know, up and running yet. Uh, we've also spoken to the manager of a care home in Castle Douglas. Now, she told us that none of her staff have been tested, but at the care homes they run in England, the staff and the residents have been tested. And I quote her direct, she said, England are far in front. Scotland really needs to catch up here. So the cabinet secretary told us on the 19th of May that all care home staff will be tested. It's not happening across the south of Scotland. Surely that's your responsibility, not the responsibility of health boards or care home providers or even the councils. Uh, I don't think you've ever heard me try to evade responsibility for any aspect of this, but I would also not be doing my job properly if I didn't talk about the different partnerships that we work within to make sure that the policies we set 
are delivered. Some of what you said there, I, I'm not entirely sure what you meant about a portal not being up and running, but we can uh, try to, to delve into that detail later. But you heard the Health Secretary yesterday, I think, I can't remember if you were on the call, uh, the, the conference yesterday, but uh, the Health Secretary yesterday talked about the uh, conversation she'd had at the end of last week with Health Board Chief Executives who didn't raise concerns then about capacity. Any Health Board Chief Executive that has concerns about capacity knows where to come so that we work with them to resolve that. Um, the policy is very clear on care home uh, testing. It is being taken forward. We will publish uh, the first data from that tomorrow, uh, which will show very clearly where health boards are making good progress and where some health boards need to make more progress. And the job of the government is to support them and make sure they've got the resources to do that. That data will then be published on a regular basis. So there will be complete transparency around that. Um, my job is to make sure that these things happen in Scotland. Remember, this will be an ongoing um, responsibility. These are staff who will require to be tested, not as a one-off, which I, I think, although I, this may have moved on in England, but I think originally this was intended to be a one-off policy in England. In Scotland, this will be a regular testing programme. So getting it established firmly and getting those systems in place, even if that is taking a bit longer than we might like, is important to get it done uh, soundly so that we have that uh, to move forward. Again, it's not my job to comment on England. I, I was looking at some of uh, the, the claims that were made yesterday about care home testing and uh, it, it struck me that one of the, the things that was said is that tests have been posted out uh, to care homes in England. It wasn't clear to me that there was uh, clarity about how many had been done and sent back, but that is not for me to, to, to worry about. But I, I just want to be very clear that we are putting in place a system here in Scotland that is robust and that will require to test staff on a regular ongoing basis. And that is work that we will continue to scrutinise uh, very carefully and, as I say, publish regular data on so that the wider public can scrutinise it as well. Uh, Fraser Knight from Global. First Minister, yesterday you extended the period for the, the shielding group in Scotland to stay indoors for. I wondered if you could tell us how many times the Scottish Government since the start of lockdown has formally reviewed that period. And today the Scottish Conservatives are calling for the current guidance to be reviewed every three weeks. I wonder, will you do that? Um, I, from what you said there, I'm not sure how closely the Scottish Conservatives will have listened to, to what I said yesterday. I, I said very openly yesterday, what we've done is that the current period is due to end on June the 18th. Um, we hope if all the indicators that we're reporting now continue to be positive by uh, the 18th of June, that at that point we will recommend a change to the current guidance so that those in the shielding category can go out for exercise albeit they are advised to stay two metres away from others and not meet up with people in other households. Uh, we have put a backstop date on uh, the extension of the shielding period to the 31st of July, just by way of context. In Wales, they've done that as well, but to the middle of August. Uh, so this is not something that is only happening in, in Scotland. Um, and what we want to use that period for is to move to a position where we can give much more tailored advice to people in the shielded category um, and advice that will be more specific to their individual health conditions, take account of their age, their ethnicity, so that they can have informed conversations with their own clinicians about the risks they face, how they mitigate those risks, how we support them to do that. And as part of that, we also want to provide regular information on the, the risk of infection in their local area. So if there is you know, a, a concern that infection rates might be rising in one area, we can inform them of that so that they can take account of that when they're making uh, decisions about how to, to live their lives and go about their lives as normal. We want to get to that position by the 31st of July um, at the latest, uh, but between the 18th of June and the 31st of July, we will consider on an ongoing basis whether we can ease the current guidance any further. Um, so that's what I set out very clearly yesterday. I'm happy to repeat it uh, today. Uh, that will be an ongoing process of, of consideration and review. And the final point I would make, sometimes when um, you know, I, I hear comments from, uh, well, particularly the ones you've just quoted to me from the Scottish Conservatives, it's as if we're, we're doing this ju just because you know, we, we want to make life difficult for people. I, I deeply, deeply uh, regret that anybody is having to live their life this way right now. But we know that those in the shielded category 
are at the most significant risk of becoming very unwell if they get this virus and potentially dying if they get this virus. So it would be negligent of the government not to give the best advice and guidance we can to people about how they best protect themselves from that risk. And as we know more about the virus and can move to that more nuanced advice, we want to do that as quickly as possible. Uh, but as I said yesterday, and I'll repeat again today, we are not forgetting about you. We know uh, or can imagine, because those of us who are not in this category don't know directly what it's like, but we are not forgetting about you and we want to get to a better position for you as quickly as possible, but in a way that is safe and is not putting you at heightened risk of getting seriously unwell or dying from what we know now is a very dangerous illness. Uh, Brian Rutherford from Bower. Thank you, First Minister. You are telling Scotland we're still only in phase one of easing the lockdown, but today Radio Forth is reporting that people are already gathering to drink outside Edinburgh pubs and also inside their beer gardens. So are you losing control of the public? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think the vast majority of members of the public are uh, complying, not because I'm telling them to, um, but because we are, uh, I think, putting forward the information that allows people to understand why we're asking you to comply with this guidance. And if people are, are behaving uh, in a way that is breaking the regulations, uh, the, the Chief Constable stood next to me on Friday and said, if, if you're aware of people uh, having house parties or, or acting in a way that is against the law, you should phone the police and allow the police, as they have been doing, to take appropriate action to deal with that. And I would say uh, that anybody who is flouting either the regulations or the guidance that we give right now, because remember, all of this has been done for the best reasons, to protect people from what we now know is a potentially deadly virus. Anybody flouting that is, is putting themselves at risk, but you are also potentially putting other people at risk. Maybe people in your own network of family and loved ones, uh, or, or people you don't know that you may be coming into contact with. So don't behave in that way because it is it is really threatening the progress that all of us collectively together have made over these past uh, few months. Uh, but more than anything, I just want to continue to thank those who are complying. I, I know how frustrating it can be to see a minority not complying. Trust me, I share that frustration whenever I see evidence of that. Uh, but all of us need to continue to do the right thing for the right reasons. And if the majority of us continue to do that, we will continue to make progress uh, the kind of progress that we have been seeing in these recent weeks. Can I also ask you to comment on Scottish Labour's calls for urgent financial support for Scotland's zoos and aquariums, which obviously have been shut throughout lockdown. They're not making money, but they're having to still spend a lot of money to keep going. Edinburgh Zoo warning that they're £5 million in debt already. They need to open by the end of the month and they okay. face extinction. Um, I've not seen what Scottish Labour have said, so I'll uh, happily have a look at that. But on the general issue, we, we will work with all and every organisation and sector of, of the country that is affected by this. Um, and we will do that as constructively as possible. We've put in place already a lot of financial support. Um, and I don't... Every day, rightly and understandably, I have questions about different sectors and different organisations. And I think what it does is illustrate that there is nobody... Uh, in Scotland that is not affected by this and, and the, the scale of this challenge is monumental and, and we will continue to work through it as carefully and as constructively as we can, providing as much support as we can along the way. But of course, the most important thing we need to do uh, consistently with all of the health advice and evidence that I, we keep talking about is to enable more normality to come back into our way of life, enable businesses to open up again safely, enable places like zoos that have been closed to, to think about opening up again. But that becomes more possible the more progress we make in suppressing this virus. So I know how frustrating this is um, and I know how difficult it is and that gets more difficult, not less, with every day that passes. But there is no alternative right now uh, other than the path we are on of suppressing this virus so that, albeit slowly and surely, uh, we can get places back to normal so that they can start earning money again. That's what all of us need to remain focused on. Tom Eden from PA. Thank you, First Minister, and good afternoon. 
Um, John Scott, the uh, QC, the chair of the advisory group um, for the use of temporary pow police powers, uh, described the new quarantine rules for travellers, um, and I think the quote was, they were a mess. He said they don't make any sense, uh, and he said the system was better in England and the guidance should have been published sooner rather than a few hours before it came into force. Um, and Chief Constable Ian Livingston has also said the police still haven't finished writing the guidance um, sort of for, for police officers. Um, can you explain why it was only published on Sunday, not sooner? Um, and will you be looking to change or improve the rules? Um, and to the um, CMO, if I may, um, it was really interesting hearing about the, the lineage of the virus and things. I mean, in terms of track and trace, um, for in terms of the practicalities for the Black Lives Matter protests, if somebody who went to one of them uh, test positive for coronavirus subsequently, it's going to be impossible to contact trace all the people at those rallies. So will it be made public that that um, that somebody has tested positive who was in attendance there? Um, in relation to uh, your question about the uh, quarantine regulations, obviously they're going through uh, a, a process of committee scrutiny. I've not seen. Uh, the comments that were made at the committee this morning, uh, but I routinely uh, look at those afterwards and, and will take account of any comments that are made. Uh, in uh, short, the answer to your question, why were they published on Sunday? We had very complex issues to work through to make sure that the proposals were uh, ECHR compliant and that we had taken account of all of the things we had to take account of. Clearly, we uh, also had to uh, be mindful of the decisions that were being taken at UK government level because they have, for uh, obvious reasons, been in the driving seat of some of the development of this policy and make sure that that fitted within our distinctive system of criminal justice, but that you know when we were taking decisions around enforcement, that was consistent with our public health system. And when we were taking decisions around financial penalties, that was consistent with our criminal justice system. And all of that was ECHR compliant. These are complex issues uh, that require to be carefully worked through. Uh, there are, uh, you know, in, in substantive terms, not that many differences between the approach we've taken in Scotland and in other parts of the UK. There are some differences, uh, but we will work through those and make sure there's as much guidance and understanding as possible. We have very deliberately uh, tried to make sure that in how we've uh, looked at enforcement here, we are not overburdening the police. Uh, that's partly for a resource reason, but also because we don't want um, what is a public health measure to be too driven by criminal enforcement. We want uh, it to be much more uh, led from the, the health imperative. So, you know, these are all, uh, you know, complex and difficult issues that we have to work through uh, as, as carefully as possible. And that is what we have and will continue to do. Gregor. So, so the best protection that people can have from coming into contact with, with the virus is to make sure that they're observing the public health guidance and the rules that, that sit around about it, to make sure that we're continuing to remain physically distanced from each other, that we're making sure we're leaving at least two metres uh, be between ourselves, that we're washing our hands regularly, that we're observing um, kind of good hygiene measures as well. And where it's difficult to kind of space ourselves out from each other, we're making sure that we're using things like face coverings to try and limit any kind of possibility of spread as well. And, and as I've said before in this platform, the, the Test and Protect teams, the health protection um, specialists who are behind these are, are very experienced in assessing the individual risk associated with quite complex outbreaks at times, such as a, a, a gathering of, of some sort. And what they'll do is they'll assess each one of those um, particular incidents on their particular merits, perhaps form an incident management team uh, to, to, for the more complex type of um, assessments, and, and then after a risk assessment, make a decision as to whether any kind of public information needs to be given out in relation to that. And that's, a, as I say, that's, that's not a new approach. That's an approach that has always been open to these public health specialists and they're able to take at any time. It's probably an appropriate moment to remind people, though, if, if you don't want to get that contact from a contact tracer saying you've been a close contact of somebody testing positive for this virus, so you have to isolate for 14 days. The way to avoid that or to minimise your risk of that is to comply with the physical distancing guidance and don't come within two metres of somebody outside your own household because that means you will not be a close contact of uh, anybody who might be testing positive. So, so let's not forget that test and protect is going to be really important for us, but if we all stick to the guide lines, that's the most important thing that we can do right now to break the chains of transmission. Christine Lavelle from The Sun. 
Thank you, First Minister. It was just following uh, Fraser's question regarding your announcement on shielding yesterday. Um, we've been contacted by a reader who's shielding with his wife for health reasons. Um, <clears throat> he says that this extension came as a shock uh, and that they're both struggling mentally and physically. He said, uh, we don't know if we can tolerate another 53 days. My wife feels she will not be able to do this as the physical limits of being at home are increasing her anxiety. Um, they'd like to know the justification for the six week extension and how that's been balanced uh, with the potential impact on mental and physical health. Um, what can you say to this couple and, and others in a similar position? What I would say to, to the couple is, I, I'm, I'm really sorry you're in this position. And I, I said yesterday, you know, it's not right for me to say I know how you feel because I, I don't, I'm not in that category. Uh, but I can imagine how you, you feel. I, I can imagine how awful it is to be so isolated over such an extended period of time. And so the next thing I would say is knowing that or being able to imagine that, please just take it from me that we are not doing this lightly. If I thought there was a better way right now, we would take that better way because we know the implications and the impact of shielding on people. So that in itself should tell you something about the assessment of the risk of the virus to people who are in the shielded category. This is guidance. We have a duty as a government to put forward the best advice we can in these circumstances. We have, and Gregor can say a little bit more about the clinical cell that gives us the the advice that we then base that, that guidance on. But it is because we judge that the risk of the virus to people in these categories is so great that if you get it, you will become potentially seriously ill and your risk of dying is much greater. And that's what we're trying to balance. And I know how you know, horrendous this must be for people in this category. But the alternative to us giving this advice right now is potentially to put you at, at that risk of serious illness or death. And I, I'm sorry to put it as starkly as that, but that is what it is we're, we're dealing with right now. We don't want to be in this position for any longer than is necessary. We will, as I said earlier on, we will ease the current guidance to you know, the maximum extent we can, consistent with the, the, the advice we're giving. And by the end of July, we desperately want to be in a position where we can give much more tailored advice that allows people to take informed judgments about the risks they're taking and how they, they live their life. But I would not be doing my job as First Minister if I didn't give people clear advice right now about how to protect themselves from a very, very real risk from this virus. And, and I am so sorry that you are in that position, uh, but it is for your protection. And, and that really bluntly is the basis on which we are extending this period in the way that we did yesterday. Gregor, do you want, I know you covered this yesterday, but just say a little bit more. This is not a political decision. This is driven by advice that we get from clinicians who understand these conditions best. These are very, very difficult decisions, aren't they? And very difficult situations for people to find themselves in. And I know that none of the clinicians who are involved in providing the guidance to us uh, take, take them lightly as well. There's no one underestimates the impact that this has either physically um, or, or mentally on, on people who are shielding, but, but not only those who are shielding, but also um, their, their family and loved ones as well, because it has a it has a wider impact as well that needs to be taken into account. So, so these clinicians take these decisions fully in the knowledge of the, the, the kind of gravity of the situation that they're providing advice on. And, and, and the clear opinion was that at this point in time, when we looked at the, the incidence and the prevalence of the infection across Scotland, when we looked at the changes that had been made recently in terms of um, how people um, were, were kind of experiencing changing restrictions, um, it, it was not the time. And in fact, it could have been reckless to recommend anything else other than what has been recommended um, yesterday. And, and I'm very, very hopeful that that will continue to improve and that over the kind of coming weeks, not only will we start to see people who are shielding able to um, spend more time outside to exercise, but, but, but actually that we'll keep that situation constantly under re review to make sure that um, as the epidemiology in Scotland changes, we continue to consider that and see what further recommendations we can make 
for people who are shielding so that they can um, achieve um, further and further steps towards what they would recognise as, as, as a more kind of normal approach to their life. At this moment in time, it, it would have been, as I say, reckless to do anything else, I'm afraid. And um, it's a basic scientific principle that actually once you've made a change within the system as well, you need to be able to assess that change and make sure um, that um, you, you're able to properly uh, measure and assess the impact that those changes have made before you go on to make any further uh, changes to it. But we know how difficult this is and you know we frequently get questions at these uh, daily updates rightly legitimately understandably i'm not complaining about this that are along the lines of do you think if you'd taken tougher action sooner at the outset of this uh, epidemic we might have had fewer people dying now we took the best decisions we could at the time based on the best evidence but these are things we will all no doubt agonize over and look at for a long time to come uh, but given those questions, you know, I, I would simply say that now to be asked at, at this stage, you know, don't you think we should be lifting restrictions sooner, even although we know that potentially would put more lives at risk, is kind of coming at it from completely the, the opposite angle. These are all difficult judgments to make and difficult balances to strike. But all along, the, the protection of human life and trying to reduce the number of people who die from this virus has been what has, has driven these decisions and it will continue to be what drives these decisions uh, and you know that is it said knowing the implications of this for people who are living in, in these circumstances right now and we will always try to move on to a better position as quickly as we can uh, consistent with doing that safely. Uh, Tom Martin from The Express. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you, First Minister. Um, just going back to the CMO's um, remarks related to this genetic work that's been carried out, um, he, he seemed to, from what I understand, it, it suggests that the virus has been here earlier than we first thought. I just wondered, do we know sort of how long, when, when, when did, do we now think it came to Scotland? And also, if I may, um, you referred to work on the way to identify, uh, sorry, on the K number in helping identify super spreading events and clusters. Are we aware of what, how many of these are sort of currently live, as it were, that might be fueling um, community transmission? Um, I'll hand over to Gregor in a second. I think we, we have a visitor in the back of your screen here, Tom, uh, which is, uh, if, if I wasn't listening to your question at any stage, it was because I was watching the, the younger member of your family there. He's very welcome uh, in joining us. Um, we, it, this is not about saying that there are, you know, because of lockdown and because of the restrictions that are in place right now, we shouldn't be having any of these kind of events. That's what lockdown is for, to make sure that we're not giving the virus those opportunities uh, to, to spread, but I'll hand over to Gregor maybe to, uh, since he's much more qualified than I am, to talk in a bit more detail about what the, the genomic sequence and science is telling us. So, so what this work tells us is, is that um, right back at, this, at the, the, the kind of start of when we started to experience cases in Scotland, um, back in the, the kind of early part of March, um, although the majority of those cases we were um, detecting, when you do the genomic sequencing on them, you could associate them with um, uh, if you like, injections of the, the virus from, or importations of the virus from abroad, um, not all of them could you kind of clearly determine that there was a, a, a travel history. And what that suggests is that there was some form of community transmission which was underway in Scotland probably during the month of February. But it's difficult to, to kind of be closer than that, than that and, and kind of say with any kind of certainty at what point these viruses may have been introduced. You remember at that time of the year, we had all sorts of respiratory infection, um, which was um, um, currently uh, across Scotland. It coincides with um, the, the kind of normal flu season. It coincides with a number of other kind of viral pathogens that we see at that time of the year as well. So it wouldn't be able to say with, with real certainty as to at this point in time whether someone who was experiencing the kind of symptoms we would associate with COVID-19, the cough, the fever, um, was specifically related to um, COVID-19 or one of these other pathogens. Um, as I say, certainly the, at the moment, the, the, the best estimates that we have from this genomic sequencing is, is that there were probably importations in February, but we can't say with any certainty other than that um, as to when they would arrive in Scotland. 
Thanks. Um, Simon Johnson from The Telegraph. Hi. Um, the Scottish Government yesterday published public guidance on your um, lockdown route map. And on holidays, it said when restrictions are lifted, we would, in we would encourage people to holiday at home to support Scotland's tourism industry. Um, however, the STA last week said that it believed that most tourism businesses cannot operate within the two minute, the two metre rule. And um, the ferry company Calmac has said that it can only op operate at 17% of capacity with a two metre rule. I just wondered if you think the two metre rule will have to be relaxed in order for people to follow your government's advice to holiday at home. Um, and more generally, do you, do you envisage if uh, the UK government relaxes the two metre rule in England, whether that will be uh, copied up here or whether you might go your own way on that? Um, we'll, we'll take the decisions we think are right for, for Scotland. Um, although we we'll obviously, as we, we always do, have discussions uh, between the four nations of, of the UK um, that, that help to, to inform that. But we'll fundamentally take the decision we think is, is the right one. I, let me say, just to, to preface the substantive part of my answer, I understand the challenges that all businesses are going to face in adapting to the, the COVID world that we're going to be living in for some time. You know, to, to, to become operational while not uh, allowing the virus to spread is not going to be easy. And we are talking to uh, businesses across all sectors of the economy as we work to put guidance in place for how they, they do that. And clearly that's going to be more difficult in some sectors than it will be in others. Fergus Ewing uh, will make a, a statement in Parliament tomorrow on uh, tourism. And, you know, he is uh, in particular talking to, to the tourist sector about how they adapt and how we, we hope that they can start to look forward to reopening um, at some point over the summer. Um, on the two metre rule though, I, I have had no advice given to me and, and to the best of my knowledge, although I obviously don't see all the advice that the UK government gets, but I've not seen anything they've had that would advise a, a change in the two metre rule right now. Um, in fact, on the contrary, most of the advice I see says that uh, the two metre rule should be retained and you know if you read the uh, the uh, research that was published I think in the Lancet last week um, it's very clear although it was interpreted differently in, in some newspapers it's very clear that uh, the risks of contracting the virus increase if you go from two meters to one meter but also what the advice says is that these are not simple equations. If you reduce the distance then you probably also have to reduce the time. Uh, so right now we say a close contact would be two metres for 15 minutes or more. If you go to one metre, then that will have uh, an impact on the, the length of time you can be that close to somebody. And also it would have implications for face coverings, etc. So this is not a simple equation. It is a, a complex uh, decision to, to take and one that has to be very soundly and, and carefully based. But the, the key point I would make today is that you know, all of the evidence and advice I have seen up until now would say that we should retain the two metre rule. Now, if that changes in future, we will consider that as we, we would always do. Uh, but that is not the case at the moment. Two metres is very much what the, the advice is, is steering us towards right now. Do you want to add anything, Gregor? No, okay. no. uh, Libby Brooks in The Guardian. Hello, First Minister. Um, you've, you've already agreed that there should be an inquiry into the Scottish Government's handling of the pandemic in, in the future. But I wanted to ask what body you think should set up that inquiry and if you agree that it should be for the Scottish Parliament to decide the inquiry's terms independently. Um, look, I haven't come to any decisions on any of this. I mean, I, I do think there will be an inquiry. I think that will be true UK-wide. It certainly will be true in Scotland, but the relationship between those two things will be uh, has to be decided as well. So I'm, I'm firmly of the view, and I want that to be the case, because I want to make sure lessons are learned for any future situation like this that we're dealing in. But, you know, I'm, I make no apology for saying that I'm still very much focused on getting us through the here and now, because we are not out of this yet, and there is a big, big challenge still lying ahead of us. Now, uh, we will come to a point where we decide with Parliament uh, exactly what form an inquiry takes, what the remit is, who decides that. We have an Inquiries Act. The Inquiries Act 2005 is a piece of legislation uh, that is already there and would be the, the legislation that we usually establish public inquiries under. Um, but what I would say right now is that I 
there's no there's no sense of defensiveness on the Scottish government's part about this. I am as keen and interested as anybody is, perhaps given my perspective on these things, even more so in some respects, to make sure that in the fullness of time we take a very hard forensic look at what we did, what we didn't do, what we could have done differently, what we did right, so that lessons are learned for the future, because I hope it's not um, any time soon, but we could be dealing with a pandemic sometime in the future. So it's really important that this takes place. So I will want to make sure there is widespread uh, buy-in and agreement for whatever terms of reference we ultimately decide. But for the moment, I need to keep focused on getting us through uh, and out, hopefully, the other side of this pandemic before we spend too much time thinking about what comes after that. Uh, Vivian Aitken from the Daily Record. Good afternoon, First Minister. Um, just following on from what the Chief Medical Officer said this afternoon, um, that it's now expected that there, there was spread of COVID-19 in February. Are there any plans to go back and look at people who have died of respiratory illness or pneumonia at that time to see if their deaths could be attributed to that? I'll, I'll ask Gregor to look at that. I'm not sure if we've got any uh, plans underway. What I would say, and, and I would encourage um, everybody who's interested in this to look and, and maybe wait till tomorrow to the, the most uh, up-to-date report is published, but the NRS, uh, National Records of Scotland, report on numbers of death, when they, they report on uh, the, the trend of deaths and the excess deaths over the five-year average, uh, while Gregor's right that the research he's talking about today shows that there may have been importation into Scotland in February. None of that broader evidence that I have looked at suggests that there was a significant spike of deaths that early on, so that there wasn't a sort of excess death uh, phenomenon going on then. So that would suggest that uh, that there perhaps isn't that issue to look at in detail, but that's you know coming from a non-specialist who simply looked at that data. It may be that in the fullness of time we do more of a look at that. I think it's really important that we are careful um, how we consider this because whilst I think it's um, fair to speculate that there may have been a few cases um, that, that were apparent in February, there, there are no signals that are coming through from anywhere else in the system, either through hospital admissions or through excess deaths or anything, that this was any significant spread at that point in time. And in fact, we would have seen very many more cases presenting in that early part of March if there had been any signs of widespread community transmission in February. So, so, so I need to be very clear about what is being said here. What we are saying is that this data suggests there may have been some cases which were imported into Scotland during February, but but in the reality is that they're likely to be very few in number. Yeah, and if you look at all of the indicators, and you, and you know this is all publicly available information, um, whether it's on um, hospital admissions, ICU admissions, or deaths. Uh, obviously, I don't have it in front of me right now, so I'm not giving you specific dates. But the the increase and the peak spike of all of these came uh, from sort of late March through April. Um, and so there is no indication from uh, all of that data that there was a significant uh, issue in February, although, as Gregor says, this research tells us there may have been some cases in the community that early on. Uh, David Ball from The Herald. Uh, thank you, First Minister. Um, the Scottish Government's COVID um, has considered... Sorry, David, I'm not hearing tests. you. I'm not hearing you, David. You're breaking up. Oh, can you hear me now? That's a bit better, I think, yeah. Sorry about that. Um, the Scottish Government's COVID advisory group has considered the potential of random tests in certain groups. Um, I can ask whether this is being actively considered and whether this would be sort of frontline and key workers or it could include people who fall into certain um, demographic groups who may be more at risk. Uh, so yes, all of this is under consideration. Uh, what I would describe more as, as routine testing. So we, we have testing right now that is symptom driven, the people we're asking to come forward if they have symptoms through Test and Protect, but also uh, testing that is more routine. So we've talked today already about care home staff, uh, that ongoing routine testing. We're considering uh, whether we should extend that into other groups that... Uh, the, other group that would immediately come to mind, obviously, is healthcare uh, staff, uh, but there may be other groups that we look at uh, in that context in the future as well. And whether that would be that kind of routine testing would be doing the entirety of um, a particular group or doing sample testing would be part of that consideration. Uh, 
do you want to say any more? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, in terms of how we kind of go forward with our kind of the broader testing strategy, I've asked our chief scientific officer for health, uh, Professor Crossman, to examine this in detail with his um, subgroup of the CMO advisory group to, to kind of bring forward plans as to how best we can use the the, the testing capacity that we've got to, to make sure that we're learning and continuing to um, uh, use the, 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 the kind of testing to best effect in Scotland. And that kind of more routine testing will be a, a part of our surveillance as, as we go forward because, well, uh, over the last uh, 24 hours, the, the debate about the, the extent to which uh, asymptomatic uh, transmission is, is a big driver of infection here has kind of opened up again with some comments from the WHO. Um, it is nevertheless one of the things we still don't fully understand. So just testing people with symptoms um, is very important, but we will also want to have surveillance testing to, to give us a, an indication of whether there is transmission uh, a or pre-symptomatically as well. Tom Peterkin from the PNG. Good afternoon, uh, First Minister. Um, it's emerged that five hospital patients were discharged to the home farm care home on Sky uh, before compulsory testing and before the coronavirus swept through the home. And it's also been claimed that this happened shortly after sanctions were lifted for um, that th prevented um, new new admissions. I just wondered, should this have happened, and does this concern you? Well, as I understand it and uh, obviously investigations around uh, home farm are, are still ongoing which will for reasons I'll come on to will limit slightly what I'm able to say about this right now uh, but as I understand it once there was a, a positive case identified the restriction on admissions was put in, in place again. Um, I'm going to be uh, limited probably not go much further than that in, in what I say about that specific care home today because there are uh, investigations ongoing but there's also ongoing court uh, action, which I, I think there's a, a court hearing uh, due to take place later this week. So it, it would not be appropriate, I think, for me to go into uh, too much more detail in advance of that. Although suffice to say that the care inspector is obviously looking at all aspects of uh, what happened in this care home in order that uh, any appropriate steps can be taken. Uh, Gina Davidson from The Scotsman. Hi, thank you, First Minister. Um, can I go back to what you were saying earlier about this reference group you're establishing to look at the impact of COVID on Scotland's ethnic minority population? I know you said the data um, is preliminary at the moment, but I wonder if there were any preliminary thoughts from Public Health Scotland about why there seems to be such a big difference, given that Public Health England have said that up to 50%, uh, there's a 50% higher risk of death amongst uh, Pakistani origin uh, people in England. Um, and also, will you be publishing the data around um, ethnic minority deaths? And can I ask also what the government did to ensure that the information you've been giving out, all the advice has uh, been to reach people for whom uh, English is a second language in Scotland? Uh, I'll probably come back to you uh, with a bit more detail in some of the, 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 the sub parts of, of that question, because it's all really important and I happily give you, you detail on that. On the Public Health Scotland, I'm not going to speak for Public Health Scotland today, but if you recall, uh, when they published the initial findings, which I think from memory was on the 20th of May, so if you haven't uh, seen that yet, you can go back and read it. The, the main reason they gave at the time uh, for caution around their findings was the, the limited data uh, that they had access to in Scotland at that time. So they weren't able to draw more definitive conclusions. And Public Health Scotland said at the time that it was important that further analysis and work took place. And I think it's probably better that I ask them to give you a bit more detail about the, 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 the progress and the, the likely timescales for that further work uh, that they are going to be doing. But it's really important that we do understand that. And I've said in my opening remarks that while I can only quote what Public Health Scotland uh, have themselves reported, uh, we are very mindful that while that uh, preliminary analysis based on limited data said that there didn't appear to be a, dis a disproportionate impact, that is not in keeping with findings from other parts of the UK and indeed from some other countries. So it's important that we do uh, the further analysis or they do the further analysis of that. And we'll obviously give more information about the, the reference group and who will be on that in due course. Uh, Mark McLaughlin from The Times. Hello, First Minister. Um, 
last weekend or at the weekend, we learned that the R rate in the north of England has risen above one again. Um, over 6,000 cars a day crossed the border at Berwick um, last week. Um, that's enough seats to carry the entire capacity of Edinburgh Airport on a good day across the border. Um, does this rising R rate just on the fringes of Scotland concern you? Does the traffic rate concern you? And, and do you plan to do anything about it if that R rate con continues to rise? Well, we monitor all of this carefully. Um, but the, the main thing all of us can do right now to stop the R rate rising and to stop all of these un other indicators rising is comply with all of the guidance. And that means not meeting other than the one household a day outside, not meeting up with the kind of people we would normally meet up with. And when we are meeting people from other households, keep that two metres physical distancing. So, I, you know, sometimes in all of this, it's really important to bring it all back to the basics. The way we stop this is two metres physical distancing with people in other households, washing your hands regularly and thoroughly, cleaning hard surfaces that you might be touching, try not to touch hard surfaces that other people will have been touching. These are the basic things we need to do. And obviously we monitor what's happening in the R rate in Scotland. We will monitor it in England and any other actions we think are appropriate we will take if we think uh, they are appropriate. But I don't think it's particularly helpful for me to speculate beyond that at this stage. And lastly today, Rachel Watson from the Daily Mail. Thanks, First Minister. Can I just go back? You were asked about hospital acquired COVID-19 earlier, um, and you've spoken a lot about suppressing the virus in the community. Is there more the Scottish Government can do to suppress COVID-19 in hospitals? And if so, what are you looking at to do that? And also on the two metre rule, Boris Johnson has said that he will consider reducing that um, to one metre in line with the World Health Organisation advice. Given that is the World Health Organisation advice, will you consider it if Boris Johnson does it as well? Um, I'll make my own uh, decisions based on the advice I have, and I think that's, that's my responsibility to do. So I will not simply follow what somebody else does unless I think it is the right thing to do for Scotland. Um, I... I can I answer this question? I think because I think it was Simon Johnson asked me pretty much exactly the same uh, question. Um, but on uh, the the evidence and the advice, I, I do think people should read a, a little bit more in depth about what the advice says around this. Uh, the the report that was, uh, I think, on the front page of your UK edition of the newspaper last week that the this. Uh, study that had been published in the Lancet said that there was no risks or something like that to reducing to one metre is not quite what the report said. It actually said, I think it was, and if I'm getting this not entirely accurately, I, I apologise, but I think it said that the, the risk of going from two metres to one metre was like increasing uh, the risk of getting the virus from something like between three and ten times. Uh, so there is a difference between two and one metres. And as I said earlier on, it's not just about the distance. As you reduce the distance, there is implications for the time and the other measures you have to take. So this is not a straightforward uh, calculation or judgment to make. Uh, it's one that it is important to make on the basis of the best evidence and advice. And all of the advice uh, and evidence that I've seen so far would tell me that we should stick with two metres at the moment. Um, and if that advice changes, I will consider that um, in line with that. But um, I'll continue to take these decisions based on what I think is right uh, for Scotland. Uh, on the first part of your question, um, I, I would just you, you, you sort of introduce your question by saying I was asked about hospital acquired infection. The, the fundamental point I was making, which is just really important to, to understand, is that we cannot yet assume that all of these infections were hospital acquired. And that's the further work that has to be done. Because somebody tests positive for this virus in a hospital, a patient in a hospital or somebody who works in a hospital, may mean that they acquired the infection in hospital. We certainly cannot rule that out. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they did so, because they could have pick the infection up in the community, been incubating it, and it wasn't until they were in hospital that they were diagnosed. So it is really important that we understand that. Is there more we can do to suppress the virus in hospitals? We absolutely must always consider that and do whatever we need to do. The Scottish Government has a, a nosocomial working group that is looking at all of these issues right now and giving advice to, to government about the measures that we uh, need to take to make sure that everything possible has been done to, to reduce 
um, and hopefully eradicate the possibility of transmission within hospitals. Last point I would make on this before seeing if Gregor wants to add anything is that you know, the, the issue of hospital acquired infection is is not a new thing. You know, when I was health secretary a, a few years ago, the uh, all the focus then was on C. difficile because that was the infection that was causing huge concern. And, you know, at the time we had the Vale of Leaven outbreak. So these uh, infection prevention and control imperatives in hospitals are there all of the time. What we need to do with this virus is make sure that there's we're understanding all of the particular things that need to be done given the nature of this virus and, and in particular how it spreads. So, so countries and healthcare systems around the world are constantly learning and accumulating evidence that, that, that helps us guide us how we can um, institute better and improved infection prevention and control techniques. But we're very fortunate to have the expertise that we do have in Scotland. In fact, we've got um, world-class expertise in terms of the, the, the people who are involved in Scotland. And we'll continue to work through these research networks to make sure that not only do we learn from other countries, but actually that we're able to provide other countries as well with information that helps them to learn as well. That's, that's, that's the way that um, the, the, these networks are, are, are set up. And um, there's no doubt about it, I've said on, on many an occasion, this is a virus that uh, all the evidence suggests spreads much more easily in confined, enclosed environments such as institutions like a hospital. And we just need to make sure that we're taking all the steps um, that are necessary as, as, as we develop this learning to make sure that we are improving our record on it. OK, thank you. Uh, that concludes the questions for today. My thanks to the journalists, uh, as always. Uh, my thanks to Gregor and to Anna, our BSL interpreter for today. And thank you, uh, as always, to all of you for joining us. Uh, please keep abiding by the guidance and the rules. Um, as I keep saying, I know it doesn't get any easier. It gets more difficult for all of us, particularly those of you who are in the shielded group. But the reasons we're doing this remain as they have always been. These are the ways in which we will continue to suppress this virus and in continuing to suppress it, to drive it to an even lower level than it is today, that's how we will then be able to move forward, hopefully uh, more quickly uh, towards getting some normality back into our lives. So thank you for everything you're doing. Um, I will be giving tomorrow's update in the Scottish Parliament around uh, 20 past 12 tomorrow and then taking questions from opposition party leaders and I will be back here in St Andrew's House with you at 12.30 on Thursday but thank you for joining us for now.